Stand with me, if you will. I'll be reading this morning from the 14th of Luke. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Strong words, are they not? Let's pray together. Father, um, teach us from your word this morning. Hide the messenger, make the message clear from the one who has written it, the Holy Spirit. May he be free to move among us with conviction, with power, with comfort as they are appropriate. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and if you have not already, please turn with us to the 14th chapter of Luke. Beginning in verse 25, counting the cost. A little two-part series on counting the cost. Heard of a couple not long ago who got married. And soon afterward, uh, you know, the husband stopped wearing his wedding ring. This was cause for concern to the wife. And so she said, Paul, why have you stopped wearing your wedding ring? He said, well, it cuts off my circulation. She said, that's what it is supposed to do. <laughs> Cut off circulation. Well, this passage is about the same, the same issue as it relates to our relationship as Christians, or at least professing Christians, as the bride of Christ. Some of us have taken off our wedding ring. We're still flirting with other idols. Our commitment is half-hearted at best, and Jesus' point is that just that just won't do. You can't be half in and half out and be, be my disciple. Disciples are not those who sit on the fence, not that we never have a bad day or even a bad patch in our life, we do. But in their heart of hearts, disciples are committed. You know, a lot of people, and this is taught, unfortunately, this is taught in a lot of very good churches. So, you know, please kind of listen up because you may have occasion to run across it sometime. But a lot of people believe there are two levels of Christians. That there are those who kind of have the facts squared away and they believe the facts, but there is an unchanged life behind that. They're kind of the moderates. And then there are, in this teaching, a few, you know, gung-ho marine types. These are the, usually the missionaries and the pastors and a few others like that that are a little on the fanatical side, and those are the disciples. Radical Christians, those who are all in. One commentator, for example, says this. He says, Jesus seems to make a distinction between salvation and discipleship. Salvation is open to all who will come by faith, while discipleship is for believers willing to pay a price. Salvation means coming to the cross and trusting Jesus Christ, while discipleship means carrying the cross and following Jesus. I don't know where he got that, beloved, but he didn't get it 
from Jesus. Jesus never says or implies. For those of you who want the easy way, you just want to kind of keep on having whatever idols you have in your life, doing whatever you want with your life, but you'll trust in me as your Savior. You can line up over here. This is the comfort zone. For those of you who want to be really disciples and you want to really dig in and you want to know what it's all about, you can line up over here. This is the disciple line. This is not biblical. Despite where you may hear it taught. Jesus never says, I need a bunch of Christians in a few green berets. He never implies that fact. In fact, if you look closely at this passage of Scripture, you will notice in verse 25, he is speaking to the whole of great crowds of people who are following him. He's not just speaking to the 12. He's not just speaking to some elite group here. This is a message for, about discipleship for everyone. There's not two levels. There's just one. Neither Jesus nor the Bible know anything about multi-level Christianity. There's no class distinction between those who are regular Christians and those who are hardcore disciples. Jesus nowhere advocates that you can accept Jesus as Savior now and then accept him as Lord later on, maybe. And that's taught. It's taught in what, when I was going to school, was the primary evangelical seminary in this country at the time. It's lost a lot of its standing, and I believe it's because so many in that seminary subscribe to this very teaching. It just isn't biblical, beloved. The Bible says in Romans 10.9 that if you confess Jesus as Lord, that's lordship. At the beginning then you will be saved. It's not that you can accept him as Savior now and then accept him as Lord later on. It's not like you can say, well, I'll be, I'm a Christian, but I'm not into all of that discipleship stuff. That's for somebody else. That's a joke and a misnomer. Our heart has to be after him. We will mess up at times in our behavior, but I, our heart has to be in him. To be a Christian is to be a disciple, and to be a disciple is to be a Christian. They're the same. And I, you know, I challenge you to read through the Gospels and conclude anything other than that. As this passage opens, Jesus is finally leaving this extended lunch, you know, that he's had at the home of one of the leading Pharisees. We've been through all the teachings that he did there. And now these great crowds are following him. They're following him for the wrong reasons, they're in it, some of them for the entertainment, some of them because it's just a thing to do, it's trendy. A lot of them are in it because they think he's going to Jerusalem because he's now on his journey to Jerusalem. He's within the last six months of his life. He's on his way to Jerusalem, extended trip that he takes to get there, and they think he's going to Jerusalem to essentially claim his kingdom as Messiah, and they want to be in on that. But instead, he's going to Jerusalem to die to pay the price for entrance to the kingdom that they are so anxious to get into, but they simply don't understand that. They don't get that, not one little bit. These people think they're already in. They think that because they were born a Jew, part of God's chosen people, that because they are doing their best to keep the law, they think that they are in, and Jesus knows differently. That's why three times in this passage, Here's one of the principles of interpretation. For those of you who are truly interested in Bible study, you always look for repeated words and phrases, right? Three times in this passage, we heard the phrase, cannot be my disciple. So guess what the subject of this section of Scripture is about? It's about how not to be a disciple of Christ and therefore how to be a disciple of Christ. Jesus is using this as one more way to define saving faith. Saving faith, <clears throat> excuse me, salvation is by faith alone. But faith is costly. Faith is costly. And that's the message that Jesus is getting across here. Jesus is not a seeker-friendly evangelist. 
who tells his followers, well, I'll tell you what, let's just get people in first. We'll, you know, let's entertain them, let's heal a few, let's get them in, and then later on we'll tell them about the cross. Maybe, if ever. He doesn't do that. Jesus is up front about what Christianity is about. He's up, he's up front about what the cost is, and he's saying to those who may want to be his followers, who are thinking about that, count the cost before you make the commitment. Yes, I paid the price, and I'm going to do everything there is to buy your salvation. That's all on me. But if you're going to commit to me, it's a marriage, and there's a cost. Count the cost. If you've looked at your phone bill lately, you know what I'm talking about, right? Your phone bill comes. You thought you signed up for your phone for $29.95 a month, right? Then the phone bill comes, and it's... 50, 60 dollars or whatever. And you look at it and say, what, where's the 29.95? Well, it's there, but on top of that, there's all kinds of federal, state, and local taxes, right? All kinds of totally unintelligible access charges. You don't know what they mean. You've been taken in. Jesus doesn't do that. A lot of people advocate that's how we should get people to Christ. Jesus never goes there. Jesus challenges people on every occasion when he runs into them, count the cost. And that's what he's doing in this passage. You want to be my follower? There's a cost that attaches to that. Now, to kind of get the sense of this passage, let's go to the last part first, verses 34 and 35, which we did not read this morning. 34 and 35, where he says, Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> Jesus says that so often. Listen up. Pay attention to what I'm saying here. And the example he uses is salt. This is a warning. You know, modern, we, it's hard for us to get this because modern table salt is generally pretty pure, and it doesn't tend to lose its savor. Stay salty. But that wasn't true in the time in which Jesus was teaching. In Bible times, the salt came with a lot of impurities in it, typically from the Dead Sea. And so they would bring the salt in, but there'd be a lot of impurities, and after a time, the salt would wear away. What would be left was this, is this useless substance that's no good for anything. It's not good for spicing anything up. It's not good for preserving, preserving anything. It's lost its savor. And so Jesus here is using salt to represent a professing Christian, someone who says, I'm in. I'm in just for Jesus as Savior. But the salt loses its savor. And his point is, faith like that is not real. This is someone who wants the blessings, but they don't want the person of Christ. So easy to be. Sometimes we sell it that way. Sometimes we teach it that way. And so people grab on and they say, yes, I want, I want the benefits, but I don't want the commitment. I don't want what the cost is. Jesus is saying, I, I can't go there. Remember last week we talked again about the third soil in Luke 8 where Jesus gives this parable of the sowers. Remember that? And the third soil is this soil where the, where the seed seems to take root and it grows up, but it's choked out by the affairs of this world, Jesus says. These weren't people who lost their salvation. They were people who never had salvation in the first place, but they looked like it for a period of time. John describes them very vividly in 1 John chapter Two. Don't turn to it, but we'll look at a couple of other passages. But in 1 John 2, this should be a, a passage you kind of solidify in your mind. It's a, it's a telling passage in the Bible. 1 John 2, verse 19. John's talking about some people that were in the church. They looked good. Everybody thought they were wonderful, and then they just disappeared. Here's what John said about them. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. They weren't real. He said, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be plain that they were not all of us. You would have sworn they were true. They were at church every Sunday. They put money in the offering plate when it went by. They may have even taught a Sunday school class. They looked genuine. But when the going got tough, man, they were out of dodge. 
And John's saying they weren't real. It's not that they lost something, it's that they never had it. The writer to the Hebrews makes the same point in Hebrews 6. It's a, th this is one of the, I mean, this ought to send a chill down all of our spines. Hebrews 6, what, what the writer of the Hebrews says, beginning in Hebrews 6, verse 4, listen to this. I don't know if you knew this, these kind of passages are in the Bible, but here they are. Hebrews 6, verse 4, he says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, they've had the gospel. They've known the word. It's been presented to them. It's impossible in the case who have one, of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. They've been around and they have seen the Holy Spirit in action. They've been in the, in, 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 around the Christian people where the Holy Spirit was evidently at work in the lives of people. And then they have fallen away. It's impossible when they've fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Seems to be suggesting you can have enough of the gospel, hear it enough times, put on enough of a show, maybe even think you're really real, and then you fall away. That there can be a time even in this, because typically we say, and this is generally true what the Bible's teaching, where there's life, there's hope, right? But the Bible also teaches sometimes when there's life, hope is gone, even though there's life. Pharaoh is a prime example in the Old Testament. He began to harden his heart against God, and pretty soon God was hardening his heart. Talk about having seen what the Holy Spirit was. He had the, some of the greatest miracles in Bible history happened in front of his eyes, and he refused it all. It's possible to look good, beloved, and turn your back. It's possible to be salt that's got it, that lost its saltiness because you were never salt to start with. Now, to prevent that from happening, Jesus says, I want you to count the cost before you commit. I want you to commit. I want you to be mine. I love you desperately. I'm going to prove how much because I'm going to die for you. I want you to come. But I want you to count the cost first. And he gives two examples. Verses 27 through 31 there, he says... What if somebody builds a house and they didn't really count the cost and they get the foundation done and maybe they get, you know, a couple of windows and a front door and, and then they're done. And they didn't count the cost. They couldn't finish it. Or suppose a king goes out and he's going to go to battle, but it turns out he's got 10,000 soldiers. The enemy has 20,000. He better not go until he figures out he's got a plan how he's going to defeat 20,000 with 10,000, right? He's not going to do that unless he knows He's got a plan that will work. Count the cost. That's the message. We were in Edinburgh, Scotland. Three years ago? Three years ago. Four years ago? What a time flies. Anyway, we saw this partial statue built into the hillside there. It was called the Great Folly, which indeed it was, because somebody had started to build this great statue to somebody, I don't remember who, and they didn't have enough money to finish it, so there it stood. I don't know, half of George Washington or somebody. Not in Scotland, but you get the point. The great folly. They didn't have enough to finish. For years in Southern California, we used to drive on the Newport Freeway, the 710 Freeway, down by South Coast Plaza, and when you were on that freeway, you would come around the corner from the airport, and you would beyond the freeway, and up above you were these, were these lanes that just stopped in midair. They started a freeway, and they didn't have enough money to finish it. I don't know if it may still be that way, for all I know. The road to nowhere. Think about that at night, and it'll give you nightmares. Think, what if I get on the wrong road, because <laughs> it was a long way down. It couldn't get finished, because somebody didn't count the cost. That's what Jesus is saying here. You need to consider what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. What does it really mean to die to self and come alive to him? Count the cost. 
So he's really asking, are we real? Do we really want to follow him? Then here's what saving faith will cost. You cannot be my disciple. You cannot claim my name unless you renounce three things in this passage. Three things. You must renounce relationships. They must be subordinate to me. You must renounce your rights. Oh, how we defend our rights. And you must renounce your riches. Now, there's a couple of other things he could have said, but by the time he gets through those, I think we'll probably have enough, right? So today, let's look at you must renounce relationships, and then we'll take the next two next week. What does it mean to renounce relationships? You see the verse, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, You hate your own life? Some of you might say yes. But if you do, it's because you've made a mess of it, not him. If you don't hate all of those, you cannot be my disciple. Wow, that's radical, isn't it? That's pretty radical. It is radical. Jesus meant it to be radical. He's making a point. He's saying to these people, who were living in the lethargy and the self-illusionment of self-righteousness, he's saying to them, you are living in fantasy land. You do not understand what it means to be a follower of me or a child of God. Because in order to do that, you must understand that discipleship, to be my follower, is costly. And the first thing it costs you is your relationships. I don't want you to panic this morning that this is a bad thing because we're going to see it's always a good thing when Jesus asks something. This is the way, beloved. Listen, think of it this way because so many people don't. We're living in a fallen, broken world ever since Adam and Eve, right? That's the teaching of Genesis 3 and all the way through the rest of the Bible. We live, we're fallen people living in a fallen world. And our relationships, if they are not under the lordship and the dominion of Jesus Christ, are going to be screwed up. That's just the way life is. And the best we can do to put them together isn't going to work. So what Jesus is asking here isn't for you to get your life messed up by following him. He's asking you to get your life straightened out by following him. Hardly anybody comes to me for counseling, which almost always centers around personal relationships, that they're not in disobedience somewhere to the teaching of God. You cannot disobey the commandments of God and live a satisfied, happy, contented life and have good relationships. The one who made the relationships is the one who made the rules, and he didn't make them to put us in bondage. He made them to free us. And so Jesus says you must renounce your relationships. Now, he says you got to hate your family. Does he mean literally to hate your family? Well, let me put your mind at rest on that one. No, he doesn't mean literally to hate your family. One of the Ten Commandments is what? Honor your father and mother. Are they family? They're even part of the family that's listed here, right? Jesus affirms that commandment in several passages in the New Testament. Jesus affirms families over and over in the New Testament. Jesus affirms children and the love of parents for children in the Gospels and in the New Testament. So what is he doing here? What does he mean when he says you have to hate mother and father and wife and children? What does he mean? Well, he's doing what he often does. He's using hyperbole. You all remember what hyperbole is, right? From your, I don't know, 11th, 12th grade English class, somewhere along the line. Hyperbole, an exaggerated statement to make a point. Okay, that's what Jesus is doing here. It's that simple. It's not complex. 
What he's saying is not, you have to hate literally your father, mother, children, and so on, but he's saying, in relation to your love for me, in relation to how you feel about me, in relation to your relationship to me, these must be totally secondary. It must almost be like a love relationship versus a hate relationship. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I have to be first. And he's not saying I have to be first so these other poor people have to take second. He's saying I have to be first because it'll be better for them if I'm first. This is one of the things I think parents have so much struggle with. I, I counsel everybody who goes through premarital counseling. Here's one thing I want you to understand. The best thing you can do, well, there's, there's, the, the best thing you can do for your, for your kids is love God. But the second best thing you can do for your kids is love your spouse. Your relationship with your spouse, listen, parents, please, your relationship with your spouse is more important than your relationship with your children. That's not because you hate your children. It's because you can only build security into your children by loving your spouse. And we got a whole generation of parents who have been taught the kids come above everything. We got it upside down. Jesus is not asking us to love him above all things so that it'll hurt our other relationships. He's asking them to do that because it'll make them better. Turn with me to Genesis 29. I want you to see this in the Bible. Genesis 29 is the place where the patriarch Jacob has had to go away from home because his brother Esau is looking to kill him. So he goes to Uncle Laban's house, 500 miles away to the east. And while there, he falls in love with Rachel, the beautiful Rachel, one of Laban's daughters. But you'll re you remember the story. Rachel is the younger daughter. He works seven years to earn this girl's hand in marriage. But on the, on the wedding morning, he wakes up and behold, it's not, Leah, it's not Rachel that's there in his bed. It's Leah. Uncle Laban pulled a fast one on him. And then he explains it by saying, oh, didn't I tell you, in our culture, we always marry the older girls off first. That would be a happy surprise, wouldn't it? But the Bible tells us, well, Jacob loved Rachel so much that he worked another seven years for her. And it says that those days were like nothing to him because he loved her so much. Look at it, Genesis 29, verse 31. Genesis 29, verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated by Jacob is the implication here, he opened her, room, her, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So now the question is, okay, well, so, what, so, did, so, did, so did Jacob really hate Leah? Well, just back up one verse and you have the answer. In verse 30, it says, so Jacob went in to Rachel also and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. The word hate in verse 31 is, 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 is um, translated for us is, what's the word? Defined for us in verse 30 when he says hate basically means to love less. It wasn't that Jacob couldn't stand the sight of Leah. It wasn't that he hated the ground she walked on. It was simply that he loved Rachel more. Do you see the point? And that's exactly what Jesus is getting at in Luke 14. To hate, in this instance, is to love less. And what Jesus is saying here is simply this. You must love your family less than you love me. You must love your husband or wife less than you love me. You must love your children less than you love me. I must be first. I must be your Rachel. If you come to me, you can only come to me if I am yours and you are mine. You can only come to me if you're willing to put the ring on and cut off the circulation and wear it can only come to me if I'm number one in your life. Don't even think about it if you have any other thought. If it comes down 
to them or me, it has to be me. That could be a hard requirement. I would be willing to say that most of us here could certainly point to some time in our life when maybe even as a Christian, other relationships have come before our relationship with God. To our shame, we would have to say that, right? But Jesus is saying, if you're, if you're coming to me as a, as a believer, the first thing that has to happen is your heart has to be after me alone. It has to be after me above all others. I must be the one. This was devastating in a, a devastating challenge in a society where family was everything. These people, you know, wouldn't do anything for fear of shaming their family, of somehow bringing this disgrace on them to go against the family wishes was unthinkable and Jesus is saying yes but if your family objects to me and you want to come to me it has to be me you can't be a secret saint over here you can't potentially have both if this person will not come with you it has to be me and how do we show our love for the Lord? What does it mean to love him? Is this some emotion, big emotional response? We have a much more emotional response toward Jesus than we do to our spouse? Of course not. Jesus says, if you love me, here's what you do, what? Keep my commandments with regard to your relationships. Keep my commandments. Do you love me more than your family? A few years ago, Muslim man in Chad, right in the big country, right in the center of Africa, Chad. Muslim man named Baki, B-A-K-I. He heard the message of Jesus Christ on a tape that he got from somewhere, and eventually he found a Christian church in his area, and he came to the pastor and he said, I've heard this message and I want to become a follower of Jesus. He, he reports it this way. He said, I told Pastor Musa I wanted to give my life to Christ. He urged me to think about it before I made a decision. Here's what happened to Baki. Knowing the price was going to be high, he made his decision for Christ. People knew about it. The first thing that happened was his father-in-law came in, and because he was stronger and richer and had more servants at his disposal, he simply walked away with Baki's wife and his two boys. And he said, you can have him back if you renounce your faith in Christ, otherwise you're never going to see him again. And Baki said, well, I, I can't renounce my faith in Christ. So he spent the next year basically following the nomadic group that his father-in-law was part of around the countryside while they pastured their cows. He would sit under a, Bible, uh, under a tree and read his Bible that he had somehow gotten a copy of. But antagonism became so great that eventually he had to leave. And after a year, he left. A couple of years later, he came back and asked again if he couldn't have his family. And this time, his father-in-law poisoned his son Joshua and killed him because he knew his son Joshua wanted to go with his father. And Baki was sent away again. Eventually, he eventually got his second son when he got old enough to leave. Never got his wife back. Now, beloved, I know we'll probably never face anything like that. Nobody's probably going to take your wife away or take your children away because you name the name of Christ. But there may be other ways in which our relationships are not in line with the teaching of Christ. You know, I suppose this is most prominently displayed in the sexual relationships that we develop over time. And we don't really submit those to the lordship of Jesus Christ and, you know, the, the carnage that we leave behind when we do that. It's desperate. Do you love me more than you love father, mother, children, relationships with others, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever it is? Am I most important to you? That's what Jesus is saying. I have to be number one in your life. I think of Rosaria Champagne Butterfield. Some of you have read about her, read her book, a lesbian woman. She led the whole women's rights um, group on the campus of Syracuse University, living her life's dream. Had tenure as a professor there in English. She wrote an article defending her lifestyle and some pastor picked it up and instead of being harsh, he answered in a loving, kind way, which we all should. <laughs> 
just challenging the authority on which she was saying these things. Led to a discussion. She, she, she got, I think I've mentioned this before, she got a letter from him, she threw it away, and, and then before the trash came, she finally pulled it out again and read it again, the Holy Spirit at work. Contacted him, began to have conversations, began to get invited over for dinner. Two years of questions and answers, and she became, decided she needed to give her life to Christ. But she knew that if she was going to do that, she was going to have to give up the lifestyle she'd been living. Later on, she was in a small group, and they were talking about the Lordship of Christ and what it means. And basically, somebody in that group was purporting this kind of easy beliefism. You can come to Christ as Savior now and Lord later on, maybe. I can almost hear her say this. If you've ever heard her speak, her, she has this, this kind voice. She said, I told that group, she said, I, I told them this. She said, I gave up my girlfriend and my career for Christ. What have you given up? She got the picture, beloved. That's what it means to count the cost. Nothing. No relationship that is outside the bounds of the instructions that God gives in his word can be absorbed into this lifestyle of discipleship. I think of my uncle and aunt who, at the Lord's direction, gave up the teenage years of their young daughter when they were at missionaries in Africa and she spent that, those years in Minnesota with an aunt and an uncle. I think of a friend that I know who gave up his girlfriend that he wanted to marry because she would not come to faith in Christ. Thankfully, she was honest. Thankfully, he found another young woman who loves the Lord. But beloved, the whole point of it was a, it was a hard time. These are people who love just as deeply as you do. But they counted the cost. They love Jesus more. They realize what Jesus has done for them. They realize that the price he's paid for us can never be repaid. It's priceless. But he's asking us, if you're going to be married to me, if you're going to be my follower, I have to be first place. Some of you are probably thinking this morning, well, okay, hate my children? No way. My children are number one. More important, nothing's more important than them. Others of you are probably thinking, hate mother and father or brother and sister? Hey, no problem. I already hate them. I mean, this can go both ways, right? The point is, either one of those, too much love on the one side, out of whack, out of proportion because Jesus is in first, or too little, hating someone, even our enemies, is a sign of a wounded life. It's a wound. It's a sign of the brokenness that we all live with. And either one of those extremes is going to cause heartache and anxiety and problems and pain if it hasn't already. Neither is compatible with a true commitment to Christ. And we want to come along and say, well, that's just the way it is. Take me as I am or else. And you know what? Jesus takes us as we are. We sing that song you know, just as I am without one plea, and it's a true song. We come to Jesus as we are. He's not asking us to fix ourselves up before we get there, but he's asking us, know where your heart is going before you make this commitment because it won't be real otherwise. The heart has to be toward me. The heart has to be for me. You haven't understood the gospel. You haven't really understood at a at a, at a feeling, emotional, intellectual level, what the gospel is if Jesus isn't number one. C.S. Lewis depicts, you know, Jesus as Aslan the lion. I love the depiction. I'm sure many of you do. If, if you've gone through these stories with your children or seen the movie. At one point, these two girls, Susan and Lucy, they wanna, they've met Aslan and they've come to love him. They've come to know him. This is after he has, they've, they've seen him die in this story for the sin of, for their sins and particularly for the sin of their brother because those were so obvious in this story. And, and it says they wanted to bury their heads in his mane. They loved him, the expression of love. But it said they went all trembly at, at the sight of him. And Lewis describes it this way. He says, he says Aslan's paw 
was touching the girls, and he said, although it was velveted, it was very heavy. What's the point he's trying to make? The point he's making is this. There's nothing softer. There's nothing more wonderful than the love of God expressed through Jesus Christ for us. Nothing. It's the velvety paw of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the demand to have that love in your life is costly. It demands that our relationships be submitted to him. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. These, these are great demands that Jesus makes. But again, he does this because he knows this is for our God. What Jesus knows that we can't see at a given moment in time. He knows that his commands are for our own good. He knows that what he wills for our life will always be for our best good and for his glory. He knows that we can't always see that. We can't always see that. We think the affections of our life are rightly ordered because we judge them based on our emotions instead of on the submission of our will. We judge it on a love which is an emotional love rather than a love which is an agape love that says I love because this is the way God says I must love. I love because I choose to love this way and I choose to put the will and the commands of my Savior above anything. Here's what it kind of comes down to. And I don't know if I can explain this so you can understand it, but let me try. Some of us here this morning, some of us hate our parents for demanding too much. Some of our young people may be in that boat a little bit this morning. Some of us as adults are still struggling with us. Our parents were so demanding we could never please them. And so we struggle with that. And how does it manifest itself? We spend our whole life trying to meet the expectations that it seems like we can't meet. We, we, don't, we don't bypass them. We become driven by them. Our hatred expresses itself in a never-ending attempt to meet what we cannot meet. Others of us are dying inside because of the imperfection, the imperfections of our spouse don't meet the needs and wants that, they, that we thought they were going to meet when we got married. They're just not who we thought they were going to be. And we find ourselves needy, needing romance, needing understanding, needing encouragement, and we're not getting it. Needing them just to be there. And it isn't happening. And so our life is driven by this need. Many of us feel that our children will be stunted if we don't get them into absolutely every opportunity the world says important is important, even at the cost of their spiritual development. And do you see that in every one of those cases, beloved, it's the world that is setting the agenda and not Jesus Christ? Listen to this. We are enslaved to what people think of us and what we expect of them. Let me say that again. We are enslaved to what people think of us and or what we expect of them. Put it another way, we find our self-worth in what other people think of us. And we try to find the healing for the woundedness in our lives by what other people can do for us. And in both cases, in both cases, what we're doing is we're asking people to do what only Jesus can do. Do you see that? That's what Jesus is saying, and that's why he's saying, I want you to, I, I don't want you to, to hate your father and mother and your children and your spouse and everything else because I think that's going to be bad for you and bad for them and I just want to prove how much you love me. That's not what this is about. This is about getting dumb, difficult, world-driven relationships straightened out under the divine power of God. That's what this is about. The solution is to come to the cross, 
to see that Jesus took upon him at that cross every single fear and doubt and anxiety and burden. And I know they exist all over our congregation. I know some of them and probably 90% of them I have no clue of. I know the ones in my life. That's why we have to come to the cross and give it to him because he took every one of those there. And, and now he's saying to us, love me most. Love me most. Make me what I want to be and will be and long to be in your life. The Lord of all. It's the only way to put the other loves and hatreds of your life into perspective. It's the only way to get away from the expectations you cannot meet and do not need to meet because I've already met them for you. It's the only way to get the healing that you think should come from a spouse but can only come from me. Come to the cross. It's the only way to give your children what only I can give them. Bring them to the cross. Love me most. Love me best. Listen, none of us are going to get this perfectly in our behavior patterns, but we need to get it perfect in our heart. That's what he's saying. Bring it to me. Come to me. Story is told, I, you know, some of these stories, you don't know if it's true or not. I can't verify this one, but the point is well made. Cyrus the Great, the great Persian king, was said to have captured a prince from another empire during the course of his days, and he had the whole family, and eventually they brought the prince before him and his family. And Cyrus was generally a well-intentioned, pretty, everything we know about him, uh, better, than, better than most in his time, a reasonable man. You may remember, he's the guy who let the Israelis go from their captivity in Babylon back to their own country. So he said, this kind-hearted man said to the prince that came before him, he said, what will you give me if I release you? This prince said, I'll give you half my wealth. He said, what will you give me if I release your children? He said, man, I'll give you everything I have. He said to him, what do you give me if I release your wife? He said, then your majesty, I'll give you myself. I'll give you myself. Cyrus was so impressed by this that he said to the prince, listen, promise me that you won't lead any kind of rebellion. You can go home. So he took his family and he went. And as he's on his way, he says to his wife, did you notice what I, wasn't Cyrus an impressive guy? I never expected that from him. His wife said, you know what, I didn't notice Cyrus. I couldn't take my eyes off the one who said he would give himself for me. That's what it means to come to Jesus Christ, beloved, for your salvation and for the healing of the wounds that are part of your life because of the brokenness that you were born into. Get your eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this reminder, strongly stated. Can't be my disciple if you don't do this. So Father, as we examine our hearts this morning, our first question is, am I really a disciple of Jesus Christ? And I think many of us here, few of us might find out, I'm not even sure my heart has really turned that direction. Others of us will say, yeah, uh, my heart is... My heart is there, I'm, I know that. But my actions right now are not following suit. So we need, we need to do business with you. For your glory, for our good. Lord, would you bring just the perfect amount of comfort and conviction as it's needed in all of our hearts this morning, I pray. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Stand with me, would you please, as we close our service by singing this hymn together.